Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be with you here today to talk to you about the, uh, now the disease burden, but not the economic, the uh, incident mortality of the disease, and then take it from there to the risk assessment and what the, does the guidelines tell us about what are we supposed to do with uh, VTE to prevent it. So we'll talk about the incident mortality, incident in VTE in COVID specifically, because this was a hot topic about a year ago. And we have now probably the third or fourth wave. So probably this is important for today even. Uh, we will talk uh, briefly about the risk factor, risk assessment, prevention of uh, VTE, and finally the guidelines. So first of all, about the incidence of the disease. So as you can see, uh, the, uh, the incidence of asymptomatic VTE is not known because we don't have any idea how much is it. But if we look at the symptomatic DVT, worldwide it will be about 2 million per year. Uh, for the post-thrombotic uh, syndrome, about 800,000 per year. Uh, the PEs from DVT is 600,000 per year, and the death from uh, DVT PE uh, is about 200,000 per year. And if we look at the same incident in the state, it's almost the same number. So 2 million per year, they would have uh, VTE. Uh, of those, uh, 300 would uh, develop PE and would die because of it. Uh, and uh, an important thing that the majority of the death in PE are because of hospitalization, either during hospitalization or within 90 days of uh, discharge. And if you look at the autopsy, you will see about 60% of the deaths uh, are because uh, from any admission is due to PE. Uh, so what are the factors that can uh, actually affect the incidence of the disease? The first uh, important factor is these, uh, the, uh, the ethnic group. So if the patient is coming from African-American, they would have a higher incidence of VTE compared to the Asian, and uh, it would increase with time. So this is basically will reflect our uh, better uh, uh, screening for VTE. It's not that it is increasing with time, but we have better screening for the DVT, and that's why it's increasing uh, from, 2000, uh, from 1980 to 2000. Now how about the incident with age and the gender? So uh, in general, uh, VTA is much higher in male compared to female, and it tends to be very low uh, till the age of 40, and then it, it tends to go up. The highest incidence is at the age of uh, 80 and above. How about uh, according, to the, uh, the, the, uh, according to the why they were admitted? So if we look at it, uh, because of, like, what was the reason for their admission? Unfortunately, uh, it is the highest in medical uh, patients, so that means that our colleagues from medicine, they are not doing a very good job in giving the prophylactic, hence the death is very high in medical patient, followed by orthopedic, but orthopedic is actually, it is a very high risk of thrombosis, and maybe that's why we have higher incidence. Then the general surgery, and uh, the least is the obstetrics. And if we go by uh, whether they were admitted uh, to the hospital or not, uh, again, medical or surgical, you can see the same pattern is, is happening. Uh, in the first uh, one month of admission, it is the highest incidence of uh, VTE. Then after, uh, from one month to two months, it will be a little bit low. And uh, in the third month, it will be lower. But as you can see, in all the three of the months, so first, second, and third, there is uh, still a high incidence of VTE. Uh, how about... Uh, uh, how about the uh, incidents after discharge? So in the improved registry, they had 15,000 patients, and they have noticed 45 or up to 50% of the patients develop uh, VTE after discharge, uh, and uh, also two-thirds of the patients would have the death because of uh, VTE after discharge. And this is looking, again, at the, the same exact data that I've just told you. So if we compare the patient, whether... Uh, the patient is having VTE, uh, whether they are in the community or the hospitalized. The highest incidence is in the hospitalized patient, and it is actually 100% higher chance of having VTE if you are hospitalized. And even in those who were uh, in the community, about uh, one-third to 50% were just recently discharged. So again, uh, just to emphasize, the majority of the PEs will happen either during hospitalization or shortly after discharge compared to the community. How about, uh, no, this is, we will uh, skip because of lack of time. How about the incidence in VTE? 
Now, this is depending on the study and on the country. And this was done uh, in the beginning of uh, the, the COVID era. So uh, we, there were two main studies in Netherlands, and the incidence at 14 days was uh, 27 to 23, according to the study. When you look at the France data, this is very, very impressive. In the France data, there were two studies. One of them was looking at BTE or, uh, or DBT, which were symptomatic, and it was just similar to Netherlands, about 30%. However, if you look at the ICU incident, those patients who were not symptomatic, they just did an ultrasound, this was extremely high, 70%, despite DVT prophylaxis. So you have to be very careful with your COVID patient when they are admitted specifically to the ICU. And how about uh, the state? The state it have almost similar to the rest of the world. And there was uh, the most recent study, the largest study, they looked at 30,000 uh, patients. And in those 30,000 patients, uh, again, despite the DBT prophylactic, uh, there were about 16% uh, uh, incidence of VTE and 11% uh, incidence of arterial thrombosis, again, despite prophylactic. So it is extremely high and much higher than when we talk about general population. How about mortality? And this is very important. Not only does the disease is very prevalent, but it actually can cause the death of your patient. So if we looked worldwide, it will be about uh, 3 million per year. Uh, but if we look specifically to uh, the higher income and maybe where, where the guidelines are more implemented, so in the North America, uh, 300,000 per year. And if we look at Europe, collectively, it's 500,000 per year. So much less than the rest of the world. How about uh, the VTE according uh, to the, uh, as a cause of death compared to other causes of death? Actually, it is 12%, which is much higher than even cancer, looking at specifically in female breast cancer and in male prostate cancer, and even let, let's look at a country like Kuwait, RTA. It's even less than the RTA as a cause of death. So it's, the disease burden is really high. High morbidity, high mortality. So about 10% of our patient, as they present within one hour of their presentation, they will be dead. So that's really, really a very bad disease to have. And uh, those who would not die, about a third of them only will be diagnosed, and two-thirds will actually remain undiagnosed. Uh, and uh, this is the most, as Dr. Nov said, this is the most common cause of uh, a, a death that you can easily prevent just by implying the risk uh, assessment and, do the, uh, go and follow the guidelines. Now, if we compare, um, uh, the, uh, again, the mortality at the autopsy, now looking at everyone who died in hospital or outside the hospital, and they have found that uh, the, the, uh, it actually 75% of the patient die in the state in 98, uh, and, sorry, 89, and when they repeated the study a little bit later, and so 10 years later than that, it uh, went down from 70, uh, 75 down to almost 60%. But when they did the same study in UK at exactly the same time, it was 81%. So again, this would reflect only the guidelines, whether you are uh, following the guideline giving VTE prophylactic or not. And 75% were medical. And uh, uh, surgical were only 25% and 75% uh, medical. And again, this stressed that our colleague in the medical, maybe they are not implying the... Uh, the guidelines, but in the surgery and the orthopedic surgery, they are doing a better job. Therefore, you have less incidence, less mortality. How about the risk factors? The, the Virchow's triad, the stasis, hypercoagulability, and the vessel wall injury. And, uh, and we divide them according to the strength of uh, risk factor. There are very strong risk factor, uh, mainly in the surgical patients. So hip leg fracture, hip knee replacement, major general surgery, major trauma, spinal cord injury, and the moderate are ma majority of the obsanguine and the medical things. So, uh, so orthostatic uh, knee surgery, central nervous catheterization, chemotherapy, congestive heart failure, hormonal replacement therapy, malignancy, uh, paralytic stroke, prior VTE, and thrombophilia. And the very low or weak risk factor are bed rest, prolonged immobility, increasing age, uh, laparoscopic surgery, obesity, pregnancy, and varicose vein. And uh, critically ill patients are uh, specifically very high. Uh, they, have a, a, they are very high risk of having thrombosis. Uh, up to 67% would have thrombosis, despite whatever you do. Now uh, we are coming to the next part of our uh, talk, which is the risk assessment. And this is very important. If you want to 
prevent the VTE, you have to identify the patients who are at risk of having VTE and then you want to prevent it. So the, there are a number of uh, risk assessment models. Uh, all of them are using like, uh, uh, like the studies are based on uh, either one uh, institute or a number of institutes, so they're collecting the data and they're coming with risk assessment model. Uh, however, they lack uh, external uh, validation. So they were not tested, majority of those, uh, they were not tested by another uh, uh, like uh, author just to see if they are validated. But in general, if you even, if they were not validated, if you take any patient who is above the age of 40 and they have uh, they are admitted uh, to the hospital and you're expecting them to be in bed for more than three days and they have uh, at least one thrombotic risk factor, they should uh, receive uh, DVT prophylaxis. So the first one, so these are the, the number of the, what we have. The Padua and the Geneva and the Improve are the three of them that we, uh, they were uh, generated by the internal medicine. The Padua, they had almost uh, 12,000, uh, 12,000, 1,200 uh, patients, and they divide them into high and uh, low risk. And if you uh, look at the incidence of DVT according to that, in the low risk, uh, they did not give them DVT prophylactic, and it was 0.3. In the high risk, they divide, subdivided into receive, not receive DVT. So those patients, high risk, but they received VTE, they, the incidence was uh, only 2%. However, if you compare it to those with high risk, who should have received, but they did not, the incident went up to 11,000. So it's a valid uh, way to actually decide which patient should receive BTE prophylaxis. The, and this is the factor, I'm not gonna go through it, but it have eight uh, uh, factors in this, uh, in this uh, risk assessment score. Then you have the improve, the improve, uh, this is the highest number. So we have 15, uh, 1,500 compared to 1,200 uh, only. Uh, and uh, again, they divide them into high and uh, low risk. In the low risk, uh, they did not receive, it was 0.4, and in the high risk, it, it ranged up to uh, 8%. The good thing about the, uh, the improved score is actually it have uh, three or four different versions. So the improved, the initial version is only four factors, but then they thought this is not good enough, so they increased it to seven factor, and then they added the D-dimer for the prediction, and finally they had a bleeding score. So if you want to imply the improved score, then you know that you can actually judge whether the patient is a high risk of having thrombosis, and at the same time, they are a high risk of having bleeding. So you can decide which uh, VTE prophylactic would you choose. Okay, uh, how about the Geneva score? It's an, again another uh, score uh, for the medical patient looking at the DVT at uh, 90 days, again divided into low and high, uh, and this is the, uh, uh, the, the number of uh, DVT, uh, whether you give or you don't give. It's 1.1. Uh, uh, in the low risk compared to 3.5 in the high risk. Okay, so we come, finally we come to the Caparini. So why I'm including Caparini? Caparini is not a risk score uh, for a medical patient. It was uh, originally uh, 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 established for surgical patient, orthopedic surg uh, uh, surgery. Uh, however, it has been validated later on uh, in three or four different studies in China and in the States and in Europe compared to the uh, Padua and Geneva. And it was found, uh, so for medical patient now, you imply the same uh, surgical uh, risk assessment for medical patient and medical ICU patient. And they have found that actually, uh, it is uh, not only equivalent, but it's even more or better predictor for uh, the VTE risk. So you can definitely imply it for those patients. However, it have less uh, specificity uh, for, the, uh, for the medical patient and ICU patient. How about the prevention of BTE? Now we have uh, two, two main modalities. We have the mechanical and we have the pharmacological. The, the mechanical is intermittent pneumatic compression and graduated compression stalking. And from the evidence seems that the uh, mechanical are uh, compared to the, the pharmacological is less effective. However, it have much less side effect. Therefore, sometime when you have a high bleeding risk, that this would be the only option that you have for the patient instead of giving nothing. How about the pharmacological uh, thromboprophylactic? We have uh, three main, or actually four main things. We have low molecular weight heparin, unfractionated heparin, fandoparinox, and finally we have the DOAX. Uh, so uh, the, the low molecular weight heparin that are uh, in Kuwait are only to either tenzaparin or enoxaparin. In the um, Ministry of Health, 
uh, majority of us, we use uh, enoxaparin, uh, which is a clixane. Uh, tenzaparin is not uh, widely available. You have to request it specifically, maybe for pregnant uh, ladies. Uh, uh, Deltaparin is not available in Kuwait. And then uh, in Europe, and in, uh, in Kuwait, but uh, in the private sector, they use a medication called Hepor. Please don't use this medication. It's less effective and it causes more bleeding. So please try to avoid it as much as you can in the private sector. Use the inoxaparin is much better in all the clinical trials. Now, uh, if we want to compare the two major things that we have in the Ministry of Health, low molecular weight heparin to unfractionated heparin, this is meta-analysis, looking at the two and comparing the two. So if we want to compare in, in terms of uh, all DVT, low molecular weight heparin is better than unfractionated heparin. If we want to talk about symptomatic DVT, again, low molecular weight heparin is better than unfractionated heparin. If we want to look at the symptomatic PE, uh, the, uh, the unfractionated, so low molecular weight heparin is much better than unfractionated heparin in terms of bleeding. They are uh, equivalent, and in ICU uh, mortality, again, uh, it is slightly better than, so low molecular weight uh, heparin better than uh, unfractionated heparin. Now we come to the guidelines, according to, uh, to this data. So just before going to that, fandaparinox, uh, it is very effective in all the patients, but there is a lack of evidence in the ICU patient. So don't use fandaparinox in the ICU, or, uh, uh, unless you absolutely have to. We come to the guidelines, the ASH guidelines, is one of the most respected guidelines, but it was uh, there in 2018, and studies came later on which were not included. And uh, that's why I included a second uh, very small guideline just to update you about what we are missing in the ASH guidelines. So first of all, looking at the uh, medically ill patient, uh, which kind of uh, prophylactic shall you use? Uh, low molecular weight heparin, fundoparinox, or unfractionated heparin versus nothing. And definitely you are going to use some sort of uh, pharmacological anticoagulation compared to nothing. And if you want to ask which one is better than the other, so you can choose either low molecular weight heparin or fundoparinox over unfractionated heparin. So they are superior, uh, as we shown uh, in the previous studies. Uh, how about uh, in critically ill? So we are talking now in ICU uh, patients. Here, as we said, fundoparinox has no role in the ICU, therefore, it was not mentioned in the guidelines. So here you have the option between unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin versus nothing. And the answer is uh, unfractionated heparin or uh, low molecular weight heparin would be superior to nothing. And if you want to compare the two, the low molecular weight heparin is superior to unfractionated heparin in the ICU setting. Now, how about um, pharmacological versus uh, mechanical? And definitely, as we just mentioned, the pharmacological is much better uh, then mechanical, and how about if the patient, for example, is bleeding or extremely high risk of bleeding, and you cannot give a pharmacological prophylactic. Therefore, are we going to give mechanical or nothing? And the recommendations say mechanical, better than nothing. And this implies for both acutely ill or critically, so medical patient and medical ICU patient. And how about the combination of pharmacological and uh, mechanical together? Uh, here, uh, the recommendation is to use either. Don't combine the, the two because of the higher risk of uh, side effect. So if you want to choose either pharmacological or mechanical because of bleeding, but please don't combine the two. This was actually an old practice. For the extremely high risk, they were using the combination, but in the, all the latest guidelines, they are all against the combination of uh, pharmacological and mechanical. Uh, how about um, uh, which kind of mechanical we are going to choose? So the only two devices which were uh, looked at in the randomized controlled trial and proven to prevent the BTE are either uh, compression stocking or the, uh, or the uh, intermittent pneumatic compression devices. Uh, so how about um, DOAX? Uh, this guideline, because it's all it's saying a low molecular weight parent is better than the DOAX, however, uh, later on in 2019 and then later in 2020, came two randomized controlled trials which were not looked at this, uh, in this specific guidelines, but I'm going to mention it later on uh, for the sake of time. So uh, how about um, inpatient and outpatient? So let's, the, the scenario is that you have a very sick patient coming to you. You are giving uh, low molecular weight heparin, for example, and then this patient is discharged. Shall you give them after discharge any form of prophylactic? And the answer is no. So the, in the first uh, recommendation number 12, they are comparing uh, to DOACs, and the answer is no. 
you should not give the work after discharge unless the patient was already on the work, let's say for because he had a VTE or uh, in the past, I mean, or they were having uh, atrial fibrillation and they are on the work already. So basically they will go home because they were already on that. Um, how about, um, uh, uh, how about critically ill, medically ill, extending uh, outside with low molecular weight heparin? Again, the recommendation is no. You should not extend uh, beyond the hospital uh, stay. Uh, and how about if the patient uh, who was admitted to the hospital is chronically ill, uh, having multiple medical problems, or they are bed bound, they are in the nursing home. This is basically in Europe and uh, in, in the state. We don't have nursing home here in Kuwait, but like the same, if your patient was bed bound. Are you supposed to give him prophylactic when he goes home? And the answer is no. There is no benefit. When they are in hospital, they are usually sick. There are multiple other risk factors that would contribute to DVT, but not when they go back to their usual status. And finally, uh, how about uh, uh, those, uh, let's, let's say that this scenario is a patient is coming to you, to your OPD with, let's say, a UTI or something like that. Are you supposed to give them uh, DVT prophylactic? And the answer is simply no. You don't need, if the patient is not hospitalized, hospitalized, they are coming to the OPD with a very simple thing, they don't need VTE prophylaxis at all. Now, there were a few things lacking in the ASH guidelines, and that's why I added this uh, guideline, which is the most recent, 2000, March 2020. Uh, and they're looking at, the, 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 again, the, the, uh, the area we are lacking from the ASH guidelines. So the first uh, recommendation is, um, uh, actually, the, the, the one thing that, one caveat to the ASH that, although we say that the, the risk assessment are very important, the ASH guideline did not mention anything about them. But in this, uh, in this specific recommendation, they add the risk assessment. So first of all, you'll do the risk assessment. Those patients who are deemed to be high risk of, uh, for having VTE, uh, then you are supposed to give them uh, some form of uh, VTE prophylactic. And you can hear the choice is wider. Uh, then the ASH guidelines, you can give uh, either low molecular weight heparin, unfractionated heparin, pantoparinox, or uh, DOAX, and specifically bitraxifan or uh, rivaroxifan. So when are you going to choose uh, which one of those? So if the patient is having history of HIT, definitely are not good. So, uh, so the priority is always for low molecular weight heparin over unfractionated heparin over all the others. So when are you going to use the others? If you have HIT, uh, you cannot use heparin and you cannot use a low molecular weight heparin, therefore fundobrinox would be the treatment of choice. If the patient have end-stage renal failure and you cannot use uh, low molecular weight heparin, then you will use unfractionated heparin. Uh, and, uh, and if the patient have a problem with the injection, yet they are willing to pay uh, for the DOAX because of the high cost of the DOAX, so they, you, then uh, you can use uh, one of the DOAX for VTE prophylactic, and this is based on the Abex trial for Pitrexaban and the uh, Magellan trial for Rivaroxaban, so you can use either. Um, how about the patients who are low risk? And again, here the risk assessment is very important. So if the patient is coming, uh, you did the risk assessment and they are low, you don't need to give them anything, no mechanical and no uh, pharmacological thromboprophylactic. Uh, how about uh, if the patient is having high risk of uh, thrombosis, yet they are bleeding or they are extremely high risk of bleeding? Uh, in these cases, you cannot use uh, the uh, pharmacological prophylactic. In this specific situation, you will use the mechanical prophylactic, and you can use either uh, intermittent pneumatic compression or the graduated uh, stocking. Uh, however, once the bleeding risk is lower, you have to go back to the pharmacological because it's much better in preventing of VTE. Okay, so uh, now this is looking at the exactly the same thing as whether the patient was in hospital, whether, whether you would extend to the outside the hospital, and the answer would be here according to what initial uh, medication did you use. So if you use low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin, because they are very effective, you don't need to extend beyond the hospital stay. However, if you choose to use the pitrexibam or the DOAX, uh, it's a little bit less effective, and if you go by the initial study, you have to extend, and not because the patient is a high risk, but because the medication have been studied in that way. So pitrexibam in the original study, the APEC study, they extended up to uh, 42 days, and uh, for the rivaroxibam, uh, it was extended up to uh, 39 days, so 35 to 39, and it's up to you uh, which exact duration you want to choose. 
uh, be careful not to use other DOACs. Please don't use any other DOACs in, in medical patient for DVT prophylactic. Apexibam was not used, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, Dabigatran was not studied at all in this specific setting. And the, uh, the uh, Apexibam was a negative study. It did not protect and it caused much more bleeding. So please don't use these two. And the final presentation is uh, chronically ill. Again, as the recommendation is no. I think we... Uh, so what are the challenges? We have lack of awareness of healthcare professional. We have lack of educational program. We don't have uh, a good... Uh, we, we have actually good uh, prevention uh, strategies, but unfortunately they are not routinely implied in our hospital. Uh, and we don't have the post-mortem uh, post examination to determine the exact risk. Uh, uh, of, uh, and the incidence of BTE. So the conclusion, as Dr. Noff said, it is a very high risk of uh, BTE, especially in hospitalized patient, uh, and we can easily prevent it. The risk period can extend up to three months after the discharge, and uh, we have uh, good prophylactic that we can give. So how can we achieve that? Uh, all of them should have a risk assessment. All the patients should have risk assessment. Then uh, follow the guidelines and therefore you prevent the death. So take away a message, uh, take a proper decision, save your patient life. Thank you very much.